In a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole filled with the ends of worms and an oozy smell, nor yet a dry, bare, sandy hole with nothing in it to sit down on or to eat. It was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. On November 27, 1977, a 78-minute animated feature was aired on ABC television. The cartoon movie was the brainchild of Arthur Rankin Jr. and Jules Bass, TV producing powerhouses known for their perennial holiday favorites like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Frosty the Snowman, and of course, The Year Without a Santa Claus, aka the story begins with homebody hobbit Bilbo Baggins being approached by the mysterious wizard Gandalf, the sorcerer telling him he would be visited by dwarves looking for a burglar. Despite his offensive house guests inviting themselves in and promising his funeral expenses would be paid for, Bilbo is reluctantly conscripted by the 13 dwarves for the promise of an adventure. The journey consists of one bad situation after another. They're almost eaten alive, violently butchered, and that's just the beginning. Baggins is separated from the company and is lost in the caves under the mountains. He happens upon a golden ring that he thinks nothing of, and while trying to find his way out, he runs into what might possibly be considered the most pathetic creature ever on screen, Gollum, the ring's last owner who promises to show Baggins the way out, if he can outwit him with riddles. Of course, if Bilbo loses, Goblin gets to eat him. We eat it, my precious. While escaping, the Hobbit slips on the ring, which reveals itself to be magical, rendering him invisible. He returns to the dwarves and continues the journey where more bad things continue to happen. They are nearly ripped apart by wolves, drained of blood, imprisoned without hope of parole. It's lucky they even made it to the dragon's lair at all. Bilbo infiltrates Smog's lair, stealing some trinkets and bringing the dragon's wrath on the lake town at the base of Smog's mountain stronghold. A bard is told by a talking bird, a thrush, actually, who helped the dwarven company earlier, uh, tells him that the creature has a vulnerable spot on his chest where the armor is missing. What? Birds don't talk where you come from? Cut them some slack, it's fantasy. Fortunately, the bard has a magic black arrow to slay the mighty beast with, and he does so, leaving the treasure vaults literally spilling over with riches unguarded for the taking. Naturally, the dwarves say the treasure is theirs by right and refuses to share with the men who slayed the dragon. It's mine, you understand? Mine! All mine! Get back in there! Down, down, down! Go, go, go! Mine, mine, mine! <laughs> yeah, something like that. Word travels of the fortune and the nasty, filthy elves show up and demand a cut for themselves. While Bilbo pleads with the dwarves to share the grotesque, vulgar amount of wealth with everyone, the dwarves call down a declaration of war. Well, that ended up with a massive conflict of one, two, three, four, five armies? Including dwarves, humans, elves, goblins riding wolves, and the mighty eagles. The war ends, thousands are dead, and Bilbo returns back to his hole with his magic ring and a memoir to write. Of course we know the ring isn't done with him yet, and the story would continue with the Rankin Bass Company creating a follow-up called The Return of the King. Despite being an animated special aimed squarely at younger viewers, The Hobbit is loaded with scary villains including starving man eating giant trolls who are tired of mutton and can't exist in sunlight, huge toothed drool-ridden goblins that ride wolves to battle, a cave-dwelling freak that talks to his precious and barters and riddles, a magic ring of invisibility that does terrible things to you if you keep using it, the freakiest giant spiders I've ever seen that can cocoon people whole, imprisoned happy evil bad demeanor elves with bad accents, and of course a huge arrogant cat-headed for some reason dragon that sleeps in a cave full of treasure. Rankin would say in a 2003 interview that he loved the 1937 Tolkien book and that he was able to make the film because the book was technically still in the public domain. Rankin Bass Productions was able to produce The Hobbit for a mere $3 million, outsourcing the cartooning job to Tokyo Animation Studios' Topcraft, who had worked with the team on several projects before, including the ABC Saturday Superstar movie. 
Director Arthur Rankin Jr. was proud of The Hobbit and described it as a, quote, good film, stating that the simplicity of the story made it easy to adapt to the screen. The adaptation of the book is quite remarkable, and Rankin would say in an interview later that he would add nothing to the story that wasn't in the original book. Take that, Peter Jackson. Not only that, they fit it into a nice, neat 78-minute single movie. The producers knew they needed to feature music in the movie, so Jules Bass adapted Tolkien's original lyrics for the film's musical interludes from songs featured directly from the book. A few original songs were composed and inserted, including the unofficial theme song, The Greatest Adventure, recorded by Glenn Yarborough of the folk group The Limelighters. And not by John Denver, as I always thought when I was a kid. You can understand the confusion, right? The greatest adventure. Sorry. Did I mention the amazing voice talent in this film? The Hobbit was loaded with incredible actors to bring the rich characters of Tolkien's world to life. Richard Boone plays the awesome, booming voice of Smog, most notable from his leading role in the TV series Have Gun, Will Travel. Well, I want to be sure we weren't interrupted while I tell you that you're a dirt wallowing pig. The man of a billion voices, Don Messick, plays no less than four characters in the show, including one of the dwarves, a goblin, and the Lord of the Eagles, as well as one of the mutton-hating trolls. You probably know him as the voice of Scooby-Doo. And you do Scooby-Doo? Yeah, I'm Scooby-Doo. Brother Theodore voices Gollum, a German-born American actor and comedian known for rambling streams of conscious monologues, which he calls stand-up tragedy. Who art thou, mysterious maiden? John Huston plays Gandalf, huge screenwriter and director, acted in Roman Polanski's Chinatown as the film's master villain. Would you call him a capable man? John Stevenson plays the bard who shoots down smog, and he has performed in dozens of live TV and cartoons, so that's probably why you know his voice. For me, he'll always be Fern's dad from the cartoon Charlotte's Web. You know, I've got a good mind to let you raise this pig. Of course, no children's animated masterpiece is complete without one crucial component, merchandising. Children's easy reader books, sing-along albums, dramatic recreations on vinyl, and of course, one of my favorite things. So this book is probably the number one reason I wanted to make this video. This is an amazing slice of my childhood. Back in the day when these shows only aired every now and again, and you couldn't pick them up off of a streaming service or even own them on DVD and play them whenever you wanted, we were stuck with the television programming schedule of NBC. So this book being almost a perfect little snapshot and slice of the cartoon really, really made my childhood great. You can see as you flip through it, let me get it up here a little bit so you can see. You can see it is an abridged version of the story. Thank goodness, because I don't have all month to read a Tolkien book. But it's an abridged version of the story. And you can see within that it has lots of graphics and lots of uh, pictures and stills from the actual cartoon itself, which to me was just simply amazing. And this was one of my favorite uh, books that I had as a child. I mean, what was I, seven, eight years old, maybe nine? And I, I, I adored, I adored this book. I loved the fact that it had the cartoon in it, not some stuffy old drawings. And this book, of course, this is not my original book. I had to rebuy my childhood just like everybody else is in their 40s. But uh, this book has been a great companion piece to what I consider, in my opinion, the definitive version of the story of The Hobbit. Listen, you can like Peter Jackson all you want. I'm just not a personal fan. I prefer this more succinct version of The Hobbit over Peter Jackson's interpretation. Unfortunately, today when people hear the title The Hobbit, they think of the Peter Jackson trilogy of films, which runs almost eight and a half hours and takes great liberties with the story, something that Rankin Bass never wanted to do. While I've only sat through parts of those films, my allegiance to the Tolkien world started in 1977 with this well-cut, great-paced, practically a horror movie cartoon that I'm still here talking about almost 45 years later. I'll be curious if Jackson's films managed to stand that test of time. If you've never seen this so-called kids cartoon and are a fan of the story, I'd recommend giving it a watch. You might just be pleasantly surprised. 
Since it isn't available anywhere to stream for free, you might as well pick up the DVD. For the price of rental ownership, you can actually have the disc to keep forever. And maybe we'll be talking about it again in another 45 years. I hope you enjoyed this retrospective of The Hobbit. Please like this video, share it with your friends, and of course, hit the little bell so you get notified of future videos as they arrive. As always, thanks so much for watching.